Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage Podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast that is dedicated to the advancement of teamwork, leadership, and culture. Hi, my name is Greg Gregory, certified speaking professional and founder of the Teamwork Advantage. Every week, we bring you a new and exciting guest all over the world, different topics, all tying back into how you can become a better team player, a team leader, building a stronger culture. And today is no exception to that. Our guest today is Jay Goldman and is the co-founder and CEO of Sensei Labs and New York Times bestselling author, The Decoded Company. We're going to get into a little bit of that today. For nearly 20 years, he's been focused on technology, design, and the art of leadership. Sensei Labs is Jay's second tech startup success. He also co-founded and led Radiant Core. Additionally, he took on the leadership roles as the head of marketing for Ripple and managing director at Click Health. Wow, what a background we've got going there. We're going to get into a lot of that. Uh, nowadays, he spends his days helping the largest enterprises in the world execute their most critical programs through enterprise orchestration, not organization, orchestration, alongside his amazing crew with more than 80 senseis. And we'll find out about that, get into the sensei mindset, going back to Karate Kid, I think, if we get into that a little bit. Uh, Jay Goldman, welcome to the Teamwork Advantage. Thank you, Greg. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm excited about this because as I was reading some of your background and going through your website, I couldn't help but remember the very first computer class I ever took. And that was back in the summer of 1906. <laughs> <laughs> back in the day when they still used punch cards. And I'll never forget what the instructor said. Computers never make a mistake. Users and programmers make mistakes. And that has resonated with me for over 45 years now. And I can remember when they said, when the computer gets here, we'll be working four days a week, six hours a day. We'll cut back on the amount of paper that we're using. All of this has never really happened. Yet with technology, the orchestration, and it is truly becoming an orchestra today. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. I mean, you didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to start a technology company. So no, tell I, us a little bit about your background. I didn't. Yeah. My, my dad's actually a software entrepreneur. And so I grew up around software from a very early age and around computers. And I, I saw what he was doing and I always thought that was very excited. So I actually... I did wake up saying I want to start a software company one day, and I am incredibly fortunate to be in that position today. But Sensei Labs is actually a spin out from a company called Click Health, uh, which you mentioned in my intro. And Click is the largest um, commercialization partner for biotech and pharma life science companies in the market today. So really sort of a marketing agency that focuses and specializes around helping biotech companies and pharma companies bring life-saving therapies to market. And uh, Click is a, a very unique business in that space. Today, it's actually a very large company. It's uh, closing in on about 2,000 people. So it has grown to be one of the largest agencies, um, certainly the largest life science agency, but certainly it, one of the larger independent agencies in the world. And so Click's focus has always been heavily around people and culture. And I had the chance to join Click when it was about 130 people, sat on the senior leadership team, helped to grow that business through some of that early hyper growth. Click has consistently grown 30 to 40% year over year since it was founded in 1997, which is an, an enviable track record that gets harder and harder as you get bigger. That's the thing about percentage growth. And so uh, the consistent piece that has driven that growth has always been uh, the focus on people and the focus on culture and how you build a an environment that gives people the opportunity to do the best work in their career and the benefit that comes on the other side of that. And so we were well on our way to, to building Click towards the company that it is today. We decided that we 
got asked so often about how we were able to continue that year over year growth and how we were able to build such an attractive environment for people that we wanted to write down that story and tell it in book form, which became the Decoded Company. I co-wrote the book with two of Click's three co-founders, Lerom Siegel, who is today the chairman, and Aaron Goldstein, who is the co-founder, and we brought in, uh, and COO, we brought in a, a friend of mine who I've known for many years, Rahaf Harfouche, who is a, a digital anthropologist. She has worked with the World Economic Forum. Um, she has uh, written a number of books. She worked with Don Tapscott, who you may know as a, a author and researcher. Mm -hmm. And so Rahaf has an amazing background and she came in to work with us on the book. And so between the four of us, we put together this book called The Decoded Company. Our, our intent, our selfish intent, aside from wanting to share the story, was that we we genuinely believed that it would attract people to want to come and work at Click, that they would read about a company that was run this way and that had built these tools and that had made these investments and they would want to come in and work in the company. And that sort of worked out a little bit. We definitely attracted a few people who had read the book. I think most people don't read books before they show up at job interviews. So it didn't really 100% pan out with what we had intended. But the unintended uh, but wonderful benefit that happened is the book became a New York Times bestseller. It gave us a chance to go on a worldwide speaking tour. We got to speak in places like Harvard Business School, at NASA, at uh, a number of Google offices around the world, on some TEDx stages. And as we did that, everywhere that we went and spoke, when we came off stage, there was a lineup of people who wanted to know where they could buy the software that we had talked about. And the answer was, you can't. It's a proprietary solution that we've built for ourselves. But Liram and I, who took on most of the speaking tour, we are entrepreneurs at our very core. It did not take us very long of the same question being asked over and over to say, hang on a minute, maybe there is some really unmet market need here that we hadn't anticipated, but is making itself known to us. And so we started to think a little bit around how could we maybe commercialize this platform that we had built for ourselves? And at about the same time, we were actually on the speaking tour when it happened, we were approached for maybe the third or fourth time by an entrepreneur from the States. Today, he runs a hugely successful business called UWM. They are the, I believe, second largest mortgage lender in the US, based out of uh, just outside of Detroit. Um, UWM went public through a SPAC deal at the beginning of 2021, it was at the time and may still be the largest SPAC deal at about a $16 billion valuation. So today it is a huge company. Matt Ishbia, who's the, the CEO, had had a chance to see our platform on a tour through our office, and he became obsessed with using it inside of his company. And he kept asking us to sell it to him. And we kept saying, it's not available. It's not available. And he, he called us while we were on the speaking tour. And he said, look, either you are going to sell me this thing or I am going to build it myself. But if I build it myself, then you can no longer call yourselves entrepreneurs. And that was like the, the you know, gauntlet was put down. We were challenged. We were not going to let go of being able to think of ourselves as entrepreneurs and call ourselves entrepreneurs. So we went back to Matt and we said, all right, we will figure out how to turn this into a product for use outside of our company. But there's a couple things you need to know. One, we've never done this before, so it might fail. And so you have to be willing to, to sign on to that risk with us that this may not work outside of Click. The second is it was built entirely for use in Click. So it's going to take us six months to get this ready for somebody else. So you have to be okay with the idea that it's going to take us six months to launch this with you. We can't just do this tomorrow. And, uh, and so he said, yes, I am good with both of those things. In fact, one day down the road when the, the book about Sensei Labs gets written, I want to be known as customer number one. So Matt, if you're listening to this podcast, we are still celebrating you as customer number one today. <laughs> the other thing he said is, also, I think this is going to be a huge success. And so I want a 10-year subscription agreement now, so I don't have to pay more money later. And so we said, all right, we will give you a 10-year subscription agreement, which I think is probably, that, that may be a world record for enterprise SaaS companies launching a business, your first customer signs on to a 10-year subscription agreement, and they are absolutely still a customer today. And, uh, and so that was January, 2015. We launched with them exactly six months later, June 30th, 2015. And, uh, and then the company has really grown since then. 
So you know, a bit of a long-winded answer to your question, well, but that it, is it, the it story. Was, it's a fascinating story, and, and stories are what's so powerful about that. One of the things I took away by listening to you there was consistent growth and being able to build that. One of the companies that I think did a phenomenal job, and by the way, let's, I'm going to tell all of our listeners, because um, we're downloaded in a, uh, about 39 countries right now. So you're in uh, Toronto, Canada, and of course, I'm here in the Annapolis, Maryland area uh, near Washington, D.C. But uh, the one company in the U.S. that comes to mind is the phenomenal growth of Southwest Airlines and the consistent growth that they did. They grew at the same rate. Good years, they kept it at a very conservative growth. Bad years, they kept it at a very conservative growth. They were the same growth every year. That's what made them so successful. They didn't go off the charts. And that's what your story there just reminded me of. Growth Today, I know a, a culture of abundance. And I think I, abundance is, is handled differently by people cognitively. We get out of our fear place. We think there's opportunity for me here. I don't have to be possessive. I don't have to hold my cards close to my chest. I can open up and participate as a team because everybody's going to win and everybody's going to grow together. Mm -hmm. What we found at Click was um, 30 to 40% is a pretty aggressive growth pace. But what we found was much faster than that. And you just, the wheels start to come off. You can't keep up with that kind of growth. You can't hire the right the right people into roles you just madly exactly. scramble to hire because you need to put people in the seats slower than that and the cultural implication became obvious it's it felt like a different organization at the lower end of that growth range and certainly if it dipped below that it would have felt even more so you get away from that abundance mindset you start to get the scarcity people behave differently in their roles they treat their colleagues differently they become much more territorial you get a lot more infighting and so Abundance is a very different mindset for people to be in. Great. And uh, I'm in an association where we believe that don't worry about getting a bigger piece of the pie, just make the pie bigger. Right. And that's the mindset of that. John Kennedy's great quote was, a rising tide raises all ships. And right. when we think like that, from that abundance growth, we get to be very powerful in our own organization. We begin to grow. The industry begins to grow. And it just becomes, just becomes awesome place for everybody. And that, that's really, really the key. So what I want to talk about is understanding a national culture of impact, okay? When we talk about what you're doing today in orchestration, and by the way, you've got some amazing industries. As I was going through your website, you've got a major bakery, an aerospace, oil and gas, telecom, big pharma. So you're not going into one industry. You are all over the place when it comes to that. And one of the things I want to get into is about how tech impacts the team, how team can impact the tech. But I really want to look at a lack of understanding of what we're talking about here and the national culture impact that has when we're talking about tech today. Can you lead yourself down that path there? Yeah, I, I think it's a very symbiotic relationship between people and technology. And when you get them both right, it is uh, uh, some is much greater than the parts you know, however you want to refer to that. But mm -hmm. I think you can get into a place where the two work hand in hand and make both of them better. Absolutely. And so when we think about, uh, well, maybe even to go back to the Dakota company, we talked about three decoded principles in the book. And, and in the book, we, we certainly told stories about Click, but we also found lots of examples of companies that were doing similar things that weren't us so that we could share examples of other companies as well. And so if you have a chance to go in and read the book, you'll see there are, are examples across industries and different scales of companies. There's startups all the way up into sort of Fortune 500s who are mm -hmm. doing things that fit into these decoded principles. But the first decoded principle is what we call technology as a coach. It's this idea that in order for us to be successful, if you look across humanity's best accomplishments, the people at the top of each of those almost always have at least one coach, if not many coaches, who have been helping them to achieve that. Uh, we've obviously, an obvious example, and, and we've just recently seen the Olympics in Beijing. And so you can see coaches, obviously a huge part of that kind of achievement in something like sports. When you hear business leaders talk about their success, especially when you get into those really large companies, they will often talk about their mentors and coaches who have helped them to achieve that kind of success. 
it's just not practical or scalable to get a one-on-one -on -one coach for every member of your team. The cost would be huge and, and it's just not scalable, especially when you get into larger organizations. But technology can step in and play some of that role. It's never going to be quite as good as a one-to-one -one personal coach. But can we identify those patterns in the business where there is a predictive quality to the technology where it can help to whisper in people's ears at exactly the right moment to get them to achieve a better result than they would have achieved on their own. And that to me is that best example of that potentially symbiotic relationship between technology and people's achievement. You might think of the, the sort of uh, prototypical bad example of this was the short-lived Microsoft Clippy piece of technology where the little paperclip would pop up when you were writing something in Microsoft Word and it would say, it looks like you're writing a letter. Can I help? And it was almost always wrong and you were never actually writing a letter. So Clippy is what happens when this goes badly. But if you think about that today and, and you know, full credit to Microsoft, that was a long time ago and their assistive technologies like Cortana have gotten considerably better since then. But if we think about things today where we might lean on Siri or Alexa or Cortana to help us out with something, we're getting closer and closer to that idea that technology can really be a coach that can help guide you in the right direction and help you achieve a far better outcome than you might have come to on your own. So let's clear this because I'm thinking now, this is where my mind went. Are we talking about this technology in the form of like AI? We could be talking about AI. We don't have to be talking about AI. I mm -hmm. think that's where people's minds go to. As we work with, as you said, we work across industries. We are very fortunate to have an incredible set of customers across five continents. We are helping some of the world's biggest companies to deliver their most critical programs. In all of that work that we do, most often when we talk about predictive, we're actually just talking about some business rules and algorithms. You don't have to get to the complexity of AI and machine learning and neural nets and all of that kind of stuff. You okay. can, but you certainly don't have to. It turns out that the set of things that come into play when you're trying to coordinate a group of people to work on a project together are very consistent and similar regardless of the type of project and who the people are. Okay. And which is why, to your to your point, we don't really focus necessarily on specific industries. We are much more horizontally across them. We are experts at orchestration and tech enablement. We help our customers to deliver and our partners to deliver the type of solution that they are experts at. So together between us, they are experts at whether it's transformation, whether it's a merger and acquisition, post-merger integration, whether it's a procurement cost optimization, they're experts at that. We're experts at how to deliver that through technology and using our conductor platform. And so what we found in all of that is, yes, you could get to AI and ML, but really there's a much simpler level of this that doesn't even require that level of complexity. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, the project leader for this project has not reviewed the project in the last two weeks. You don't need AI to spot that pattern, but a pattern as simple as that flagged to a project management office can mean the difference between staying on track and being off track. That's, that's so key in recognizing things. And it might even be as much as somebody not realizing something was happening. And it's just, there's an expression I use called TOMA, top of mind awareness. And it's bringing something back to the top of mind. So when you start to look at that, now you mentioned the word a minute ago, and I want to go into this. Enterprise orchestration. I've never heard the term. Uh, what, what is that? And you talked about orchestration a minute ago. So give us an idea. And then you use the other term conductor, right? A lot of folks are going to hear the word conductor. They're going to think on a train, the conductor on a train or a bus. This is not what you're talking about. Although I think maybe the concept may fall into the play with that. So let's kind of go through that and turn this into layman's terms here for a lot of our listeners who may not be onto the enterprise level. Absolutely, so Conductor is the name of our software platform. It is a tool that's used by enterprises to plan, track, and orchestrate their most critical projects is what we say. And what that really translates into is when they are running programs that are critical to the success of the business, many of them are transformations in today's day and age of constant transformation. 
And transformation can take different forms. It might be a cost reduction program. It might be a strategic or business transformation. And the outcome of that program is critical to the ongoing existence often and success of those businesses. So that's the, the space that we play in. Conductor as a platform brings together a few different technologies of management. We bring into a single platform project portfolio management. So who's doing what? When is it due? What's our current status on it? That kind of stuff, obviously critical to running large scale programs. And when I say large scale, the majority of the programs we run are probably it, from 50 to a few hundred people working on a program that might run for three to five years and have a bottom line impact of hundreds of millions of dollars. So these are large, large programs for the most part. We do have certainly some smaller customers who are running smaller programs, but that tends to be the majority of what we work on. So project portfolio management, data KPI and benefits management. So are we on track to deliver the thing that we said? How many dollars or other quantitative metrics are part of this program? Tracking all of those and being a single source of truth, as well as reporting and dashboarding and notifications and visualizations. Uh, collaborative work management. So actually getting the work done together. Where do we collaborate together? How do we keep track of where we're at with things and the discussions and all the knowledge that comes out of that. And then the last one is knowledge management. So all of that knowledge in a single place, all of the documents in a single place, but also there is often a learning and training component to this. How do we bring people up to speed as they're coming in and out of this program? How do we make sure that they've learned what they need? Also, how do we look for teachable moments that might come up in a program based on the execution and delivery of that program? and deliver just-in-time moments of learning for those people so that they can get the best benefit of that. That might be a five-minute video instead of a two-hour classroom session six months ago. And so how do we get that five-minute video in front of Greg at exactly the moment where Greg needs to learn that piece of content? So that's Conductor as a platform. Okay. Let me, let me just stop you for a second here because this is the place I think this might work. And that is when we're looking at... Um, knowledge base and having that knowledge library is really key. So a lot of our listeners on the podcast are within the information technology uh, base about helping uh, their internal customers. We also have a lot of folks on here that are in the call center world. And so they've got, they get questions. So they got to be able to access that library quickly. And that's what your, your product will do is help build that. Talk to us about the importance of having that library really up to date and focused. How, that's got to be critical for these or, uh, these organizations. Yeah, there's there's uh, there, there are I guess a number of different kinds of learning and training that organizations tend to do. And so you think about onboarding a new team member, and they have to go through an onboarding experience. There might be a structured curriculum for that for the first few weeks of their time on the team, and they have to go through a whole bunch of different pieces of content. And then you have things like annual certifications or um, annual compliance requirements, uh, it, whether that's something like security or, um, or you know, uh, internal policies, that kind of thing. And so those are a different kind of category of learning and training. And you probably have, certainly in a large organization, you certainly will have a learning management system or an LMS already in place right. for those kinds of things. LMSs, as a general statement, and there are certainly exceptions to it, but LMSs as a general statement are not really learning platforms. They are actually compliance platforms. Right. They are the there delivery mechanisms. Work. Right. So I can check the box that you have completed all the things that I said that you were going to complete. And then if a problem ever comes up later, especially if it's a legal problem, I can point back to our LMS and say, well, but Greg took all of the required training. So it's not our problem that he went and bribed a foreign official or whatever it was that you did. <laughs> not, to, not to accuse you of Please. bribing foreign <laughs> officials, but you know. So we... There's a whole market for that, and that's not what we do. Where we're really interested in is LMSs typically also do a really bad job of lightweight, rapid, just-in-time kinds of learning experiences. And so, and we, we talk about this quite a lot in Decoded, how do you identify those moments and then deliver teachable moments for the person who needs it at exactly the right time? We talk about a concept that we refer to as return on learning. It's sort of like return on investment. It obviously costs a lot to deliver learning content. You have to build the content. You have to have systems in place to deliver it. It takes people's time, time is money. So if we're spending money to deliver a teachable moment to you, how do we maximize our return on learning from that? And what we know from adult learning principles is the answer is not 
several hours spent in a classroom six months before you might need this thing because the retention rate on that learning is terrible and you're going to forget almost all of it before you actually have to put the thing in place. So yep. instead, can we use technology, which is very good at doing things like this, to identify that this is the moment where you need to learn this thing? And then can we deliver a very lightweight piece of learning to you at that exact moment? So that might take the form of a video, but it might also take the form of something like built into our product, we have uh, what we call guides. And the guides are there so that when you come into the product, it, you may be somebody that needs to come in once a month to update the status of a project. Well, when you do that every month, almost guarantee that when you come in on that time, you've forgotten how to do the thing that you had to do because you only have to do it once a month, right? We all have this experience, almost oh, every enterprise yes. platform. You it, know, For me, it's called QuickBooks. <laughs> right, so you go into QuickBooks and you have to go and you're like, oh, I did this last month, but I can't remember how to do it. So we recognize that you have a, a category of users of any platform who are what we refer to as perennial novices. You're never going to become an expert user of this platform. You just don't use it enough or you use it infrequently. How do we accommodate a perennial novice in making sure that you're not frustrated by that experience? And we've accomplished that with guides in our platform. You can access a list of guides. You can say, remind me how to put in a project review or update the data or whatever it is you need to do. And not only will it tell you, but it will actually walk you through the process in the platform. So it will say, click here to access the list of projects. Now we're gonna choose your project. Now we're gonna to go to the data review. Now you're gonna click on the new review button. And so you are building up some muscle memory to doing it. You're not just watching a video and then trying to go and do it yourself. That's a great example of just-in-time training that can make a huge difference to people, first of all, in getting things done, but secondly, in their level of frustration at having to do it. That's the, the, the technology side of this is fascinating. And with the speed of technology moving, I can see this just getting better. So let's kind of shift gears to the people side and let's talk about, you know, one of the questions I was thinking about is what can companies do today to become more culturally adept at doing this and recognizing they might need something like this? Or, uh, you know, when we look at those challenges there, the people side of this is so critical. You can't have just technology. Right now it's looking like we can't have just people. They've got to be blended. Talk to us about that. I, all of us as leaders need to be shifting our mindset around people. The last two years has changed so many core fundamental assumptions about what it means to be a leader and how to build teams and how to structure them and how to hire for them, uh, what it means for having an office and whether you need one and what that office purpose even serves anymore and and how to think about the expense of it. So I think so much has changed and we're not really yet even seeing the full set of, of implications of that change. And I think it's gonna to continue to shift. Anybody who's trying to say they have a definitive answer of what this is gonna look like over the next few years is wrong. They don't have a definitive answer about it. And I think um, better leaders, are, are reaching out to their teams and trying to engage them in that conversation and understand from their teams. But the truth is their teams don't know either. So what we look at today as how this is gonna work in two years from now, we are almost certainly wrong about some of, of the assumptions that we're making there. We might what lucky, that should tell you- We're pretty much wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, think about somebody who signed a lease in February, 2020, <laughs> thinking they were expanding their team. Let's take twice as much office space yeah, let's sign on for a three or five year long lease because obviously we're gonna need the space. And then within a month of them signing that lease, they had nobody in office and we thought that was gonna last for a few weeks. And here we are two years later and depending on where you are in the world, you may still not be back into that office. And so think about that kind of, you know, what, what's sometimes referred to as a black swan event. The black swan, if you're not familiar with the term, the black swan being the thing you, you couldn't anticipate. Ask people to picture a swan, they always picture white swans because it's what we're so used to. There are black swans. They're just very, very rare. So that black swan event that you didn't anticipate completely changed the economics of that lease that you had just signed and what it means ongoing to have that. And I don't want to pick on office space necessarily because there's so much more to your question, but it's a good example of where we might have had a fundamentally held deep set belief about what it meant to be a company and to have a physical location and why we had it and what purpose it serves. 
that's been very fundamentally upended. So to come back to your question though about people and technology, what we, we have been thinking of this as and what we've been working with our customers and our partners on is the age of transformation as a fixed term project is done. When we talk about transformation, we should recognize that it has historically been a fail state. You don't get to do a transformation because you were successful. You have to do a transformation because you weren't successful. And somebody else has come along and they have taken your customers and your market share and maybe some of your best team members. And now you have to do a transformation or you won't exist anymore. That's what a transformation actually is. So you start off by saying, this was not our reward for having been correct about a whole bunch of things. It's actually our fail state for having been wrong. And then when you look at the market leader and today in almost every industry out there, the market leader is the technology player. They are the one who has figured out the technology side of this and maybe has upended the market or changed the market considerably, but they are the ones who have adopted that technology or are in fact a technology company. Mark Andreessen's famous expression, software is eating the world, means that more and more industries are being replaced by software. And so it is often a technology company that, that is your biggest threat. They may not have been in the past. They don't run transformation projects in the same way that the big historic players do. They exist in a state of constant evolution. And that's really where, and I think the answer to your question, that's really the goal that everybody should have in mind is how do we change the way our organization works and our culture and our teams are structured and our technology platforms, even our office space, to recognize that we will never be in a stable state, that we will always be in a state of evolution, and that the ability to be agile, nimble, and responsive to that, to, uh, to move away from a headset of when do we return to normal, to recognize that normal is change and that if you're able to react to that and be reactive and in fact proactive even, that you are going to perform much better in whatever market you're in. And a big piece of that means adopting technology where it makes sense to adopt it. I think we saw 10 years of adoption of technologies for remote work compressed into the last two years because we had no choice. But inherent in that adoption of those technologies is the undoing of a lot of long-held assumptions about what it means to do work. Yeah. It would have happened over a decade, but we would have been at the other end of that transformation in 2030 in, or 2032 maybe, instead of in 2022, if it hadn't been for the pandemic. So let's take this now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question and I want you to try and relate this to both from the C-suite executive level, as well as the mid to frontline management level. So we can kind of, kind of roll, pull this all together. How can we collaborate today in real time dealing with this? One of the thoughts that came to my mind with your last example was Harley Davidson. They were a bicycle company slash motorcycle company that got strong but they had one mindset and they had a bad rep. They had to pivot years ago to become where they are today to become the giant juggernaut that they really are. And so they did that with people, they did that with product, they did that with manufacturing. Today that's happening at much faster speed with technology. So today when we look at that, how can we collaborate today in real time break down the teams, the silos, break all these things down and get people working together. And again, from the C-suite and then all the way through. Yeah, it, that top down or bottom up is critical to have both if you're going to have successful change management. And a lot of these programs, when you look at the abysmal statistics about the success rate of transformation, especially digital transformation, where depending on your source, but sort of, averaged out to about 75% of these programs are going to fail to deliver what they had promised at the beginning. A big part of the reason is because of the change management component and the difficulty of successfully executing change management, which is much more a difficulty because of people and culture than it is about technology. You can easily say, we're going to roll out a new platform. Rolling out a new platform is in change management. That's the technology piece. 
you're done when the platform's been rolled out. But to get to adoption is a completely different question. And that's the people side and the culture side. I think if you're going to look at this from a perspective of how do we execute a large scale transformation, even in a small business, a large scale transformation in how we operate and how we work together and in our, our accomplishment of shared goals, the critical piece is shared goals. What are you trying to accomplish and does everybody see that the same way? And so I, I'll, I'll use an example here. Uh, we talk sometimes about clarity of purpose. Why does this organization exist? And it's easy to get lost in clarity of purpose. And I don't mean this in a mission statement on the wall no. of the lunchroom. No. What I mean is, why does this business actually exist? What service do we offer or product do we offer that people are going to pay for? So here's a classic example where clarity of purpose got violently in the way of success. The music business thought that they were in the CD distribution business. Yeah. They were in the music business. But they had built so much infrastructure around distribution and creation of physical product, printing CDs, labeling them, putting them in cases, shipping them to music stores, distributors, the relationships, all of that sort of thing, that when the threat of digital came along, instead of saying, well, we're actually in the music business, we don't care how the product gets into the hands of, or ears, I guess, of listeners, we just want it to get there, and adopting digital, they saw this as a huge competitive threat. It's only a competitive threat if you think you're in the CD distribution business. It's not a competitive threat if you think you're in the music business. I would give another sort of classic example of the railroad companies that were so dominant in the early 20th century in the, certainly in, in North America, in the economy, massive, massive corporations. In fact, and we talk about this in Decoded, uh, sort of a fun fact, the org chart that we all look at today when we think about a company came from railways. The first modern org chart, you can find it online. It is a beautiful piece of design work. If you want to look this up, it's easy to find. Just Google the first org chart. It is a rendering of a railway company's organizational structure because it went from head office down to branch offices, which were organized around the specific lines of the railway and all the way down to station managers. If you draw that as a map, you have a hierarchy that comes up from station managers to branch managers to mm -hmm. line managers. And that's how we end up with our modern org charts. So that's how dominant railways were. Railways believed they were in the rail business, not in the transformation transportation business. Transportation, so as soon yeah. as trucks came along, instead of saying, oh, trucks are just a new form of transportation, we should all be in the trucking business as well. They tried to demolish trucking companies and keep everything on rail. That is a lack of clarity of purpose. So when we think about these large transformations that you need to execute, again, whether your business is 10 people or your business is 10,000 people, a transformation of the scale is still a large transformation for your business. The most important thing is, are we aligned on the same outcome here? And by doing that, can we get people out of a place of fear to a place of abundance? So if we think about something like music industry and CDs, as soon as you start talking about this, the person whose business card says head of CD distribution is going to fight you every step of the way because they believe their job is at risk if we go down this path of digital. Well, we don't need CDs anymore, so my job is gone. But if you change their mindset to, no, you're just head of distribution. It doesn't matter how. You can take on digital. You might need to build new teams and build new skill sets. Then people get out of a place of fear and they get into a place of collaboration and working together across teams. We are still today a small startup in mentality, certainly. We're over 80 people today, so we're not that small in terms of startup scale as most startups are. But we still very much with our teams focus on this idea that the outside world creates more than enough problems for us to resolve in building our business. We do not need to add any internal problems to that by not being aligned, by not working together or collaborating. When we don't succeed because of outside pressure, that is where we learn as a business and we grow and we change. When we don't succeed because of internal reasons, we are just being dumb. So we need to stop being dumb as much as we can. And part of that is in, in every business, is get people out of the mindset that their job is at risk because of this change and into a growth mindset of my job might change because of this change, but it's still going to be something that I can get engaged in and feel valued in right. and where I can grow personally as part of that. And so I say all of that before we even talk about technology, because the technology doesn't matter if you don't get that part right. Right. You know, one of the companies that comes to mind that 
understood this probably as good as anybody is Apple in the way that they got their why out there. And Simon Sinek's book, of course, Start With Why, really starts to lend itself right into this. So that starts at the C-suite. So now when we start thinking about that and changing the mindsets of people, what about down at that front line? Yeah, sometimes it's hard to translate that why that the C-suite's given down into, okay, but what does this mean for me day to day? Maybe I'm a customer support representative and I'm on a phone, I'm in a call center and I'm answering calls from upset customers all day who have a problem. I'm not really sure how to translate this big why that you've given down to the level of my job. And so there are, there are a bunch of different management frameworks that can help. We, we uh, run OKRs internally for Sensei Labs. That's how we keep everybody aligned on our team. For anyone listening who's not familiar, OKRs are objectives and key results. It's a system that, uh, that started at Intel. John Doerr, the famous venture capitalist who started his career at Intel, learned it there with Andy Grove and the Intel leadership team, brought it out of Intel into his venture capital work, introduced it to Google when they were a small startup. They still today run on OKRs. He has since brought it out to, to a significant other set of companies. He's written a great book about this, um, Measure What Matters. Uh, I think that whatmatters.com is the website if you want to go and learn more about it. Tons of free information there about how to bring OKRs into your own organization. But sort of key to this in this top-down and bottom-up approach is the organization should set objectives and key results for themselves at that top level. And that's typically a C-suite activity. You want no more than three to five of them. They should be very aspirational and you can update them on whatever basis you feel is the right cadence for your business. Obviously not too often because people need to do a bunch of work after you set them. Many companies operate on a quarterly OKR basis. We do as well. And so we actually set as a company uh, what would end up being two years worth of OKR framework. We weren't gonna move the OKRs around but we adjusted them quarter to quarter and we continue to do so today, depending on what's happened in the business. So we wanted to keep a sort of stable set for everybody. You set those three to five organizational OKRs. The structure is simple. It's a aspirational objective. It should be one to two sentences. We try to keep it to one. And then the key results, you'll measure that by. Key results are best when they have a time scope on them. So by this date, we will accomplish this measurable outcome. You can use balancing KRs to make sure that you don't over rotate in a single direction. So classic example might be, we wanna grow revenue. Well, growing revenue either means you grow revenue from new customers or you grow revenue from existing customers. If you over rotate on new customers, you might upset all of your existing customers and they're all gonna leave. So you might be growing new revenue by adding lots of new logos, but you're losing a lot more on the other side. You could over focus on existing customers and keeping them happy, but not attracting new ones. So somewhere in between, you might have two KRs, one about existing and one about new, and that helps you to sort of balance that out. Once you've done the organizational ones, you can trickle that down to the department level or team level. Now they set their team or department's OKRs that ladder up to that org level. And then everybody in that team can set their individual OKRs that ladder up to the department level ones. And that's how you can go right from C-suite down to the front line and make sure that everybody's oriented. Again, this isn't a technology solution. We actually, there are lots of OKR platforms out there. Certainly you can try them. Your mileage may vary. We have found that a single shared spreadsheet across the whole company is all we need to be able to track this in very effectively. And that keeps everybody aligned. It's a transparent system. It's open to everybody. Everybody can see exactly where we are. They can go down to the department level. They can even go down to the individual level and they can set up their own OKRs in there. And that helps you as a member of our maybe more frontline day-to-day -day team to say, okay, I understand we have an organizational objective about growing revenue. I am not on the sales team, so I can't sell more stuff. Maybe I'm a member of the product team. The product leader has set OKRs for our team, which are the things our team can do to help grow that revenue. And then I, as an individual, have set OKRs that are how can I help my team to be successful in achieving our team goals? Now everybody's aligned all the way up and down that org chart. Powerful. Now we're running out and I, we could, I could keep going on this for, for a long time. We're nearing the end of our time here today, but you've given us some great information. I want to make sure we address one thing. Organizations call their employees, employees, associates, partners. You call them senseis. We do. Okay. Obviously sensei labs. I get that. Talk to me about that. And 
how does that impact the culture when they ha- when they feel like they're all senseis? Culture is so critically important to the success of any business. When you are the lone founder in a garage in the prototypical technology example, and the company grows to the first team member who you hire, you, you now have culture. You just may not be aware of it yet. Uh-huh. And if you aren't intentional about that culture, it is going to grow on its own. And it may turn out to be a very negative thing because you weren't intentional about it. And when I say intentional about it, again, I don't mean words up on an inspirational poster in the break room. I mean, really, you have set a culture that guides the critically important decisions that you will make, the most important of which are who you hire, who you promote, and who you fire. Because those are the three key points where you will shape the future of your business. Every person you add to your team has the potential down the road to hire more people. In the classic Steve Jobs uh, expression that's at least attributed to him, A's hire A's, B's hire C's. So if you hire A's, they will surround themselves with more A's. If you hire B's, they will surround themselves with C's who don't threaten their job. So you have to stay as the founder and CEO or whatever your role is, vigilant that you hire A's at the beginning, because as soon as you start hiring B's, you have guaranteed C's by the next generation, and then probably D's after that. So culture starts as soon as there are more than one person working on something together. We took the step to say, we want to define our culture in written words. We want to make that publicly available. This is listed right on the careers page of our website. We wanted this to be super easy for people to remember. So we took the word sensei, we got to six cultural values that spell the word sensei. So it is super easy to remember this. And then we have structured everything we do as an organization back to that foundational set of six sensei values, which is what we call them. And so for us, our culture is defined by being selfless, by being empathetic, nimble, skilled, entrepreneurial, and acting with integrity. Everything we do as a business comes back to those same six values. And so we make it easy to continuously see the impact of that as an organization. I'll give you a few specific examples. When you go to hire somebody into Sensei Labs, right in our applicant tracking system, we use Greenhouse, but there are lots of them on the market. The post-interview questions are structured into the Sensei values. What did you learn about how selfless this person is or how empathetic or how nimble? Now, those things can be hard to judge. So we have an accompanying guide for every one of our interviewers. Here's a selection of questions you can ask to dig into nimble as a value. Here are some really good answers. Here are some weaker answers. Here's some follow-up questions if you need to dig deeper. So we arm our people going into those interviews. How can you dig into our cultural values and understand them in a practical sense? Then we have a... uh, Single document, this one happens to be, again, a spreadsheet. You could keep this anywhere you want. It's available to everybody in our organization. It lists every job in the company. And for each of the sensei values, what should the observable behaviors be at that job level? So you can find your current job. They are the columns in the spreadsheet. You can look across the rows and see, in my current role as a front-end engineer, what does it mean to be selfless or empathetic or nimble? And then you can also say, I want to move up to here as my next role. What are the observable behaviors I should be looking to exhibit in order to be ready for that promotion or that move? And sometimes that move is not directly to front-end engineer two from front-end engineer one. That's a common path, but it's not the only path. So we don't talk about career ladders here. We talk about career maps. Say, imagine that you are in a city on a map today. There is a nice big four lane highway that leads from this city to what is most commonly the next city that people go to. And it's the fastest route to get there. But there are lots of other roads on this map, including some trails that have not yet been blazed. If you wanna go to a different destination than the one that the highway leads to, that's amazing. Go back to our career matrix, look at the observable behaviors for that other place that you might wanna go to, and then work with your manager to figure out how to exhibit those today, and how to start to move in that direction. And so that's 
I would say how you get back to culture and how you get to understanding what it means to be a sensei in our organization today. And of course, what that means to grow and change that. So my last thought, I know we are coming up against our time and, and Greg, I'm happy to come back on the show again, if you want to continue Doesn't the conversation, it. but um, we look at culture and I would encourage all of your listeners to think of it this way. You cannot mandate a culture to exist in a particular direction. And you have to recognize that the culture will change as the business changes. At five people, the culture will be different than it is at 20 people and 50 people and 150 people. And so we think of this as we are gardeners and we are gardening the sensei culture as a garden. It's our job to make sure that as the keepers or stewards of this garden, it has the right sunlight, it has the right nutrients and water, and it is free of weeds. That's our job. So we can define cultural values. We can promote people who exhibit them. That's putting sunlight in the right places. We can bring the right nutrients in, in, in terms of the people that we hire into the organization. And we can be regimented about who we bring into the organization. We can weed out negative influences when they happen, but the culture is gonna grow the way that it grows. And we have to adapt and change as that happens. So our sensei values will hold true, but the observable behaviors might change. As we hire internationally, the cultural values in different countries will bring a different influence into that. Yes, what absolutely. does a Dubai-centered sensei value culture look like will be different than it looks like in our head office in Toronto. I don't even want to say head office anymore because I'm not even sure what that means. But to our senseis who are in Toronto, it will look different than our ones who end up in Singapore or wherever else. Mm -hmm. We will hold true to our values, but the, the way the garden grows in those places will end up being different. The observations of that. And as long as they're making sure the behaviors tie back and they're fitting it in their culture, that's going to drive it completely. And that's going to make sure the culture stays strong. Absolutely. We could talk on this for hours. I know we could, and we're up against the timeline here. I like to keep this right around this time limit because let's face it, folks are usually driving to work. Well, maybe not right now, but they're doing dog walks. They're doing other things and listen to this podcast. So I want to thank everybody for listening. Jay, thank you. How can people reach out to you? Uh, so senseilabs.com, if you want to find us online or various social media forums, you'll find us there. We write fairly often on Medium as well. You can find us there under Enterprise Orchestration Era which is the era that we are all in today. And so you can find more there or in fact, the blog on our website as well. You can also reach out to me. You can email me. I am happy to chat more about what we've talked about here. Jay Goldman at senseilabs.com or you'll find me at Jay Goldman, J-A-Y-G-O-L-D-M-A-N on pretty much every social platform that's out there. And uh, always looking to engage folks in a conversation or answer any questions that you have. And I am a huge dog fan. So if you are currently walking your dog while you're listening to this, give him a scratch on the head from me. All right. Jay, thanks very much. We really appreciate your time being with us today on the Teamwork Advantage. And folks, once a week on the Teamwork Advantage, you get ideas that you can implement immediately. And Jay certainly gave us a lot today as far as what we can do from an individual standpoint, from a managerial standpoint, from a team standpoint, as all the way up through the C-suite. So again, Jay, thank you so much. Folks, until next week, remember that having a good day is just being average. When you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, we know that you are not average. So go make today excellent and exceptional. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.